All right, I'm going to go ahead and call this special meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Um, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Mr. Rodriguez? Present. Mr. Haas? Here. Mr. Costner? Here. Mr. Hall? Here. Mr. Dunn? Here. Mr. Dyson? and I represent Native First of Broadway County, right, for the Anchorage Trust as well. And I understand that this, uh, this is a big problem for the community this winter, and the Natives only represent 18% of the population, yet we are 70% of the social uh, people in need. And there's a lot of demonizing, um, and, and this is just behind the scenes. And I'm not saying all white people are uh, racist, but all Caucasians benefit from racism. So when you try to cut the budget out and you try to find out who's going to benefit from it, you know, not only does it help the people that are of uh, uh, non, non, you know, people of color, but people of non color. But, you know, those people that are not of color have an easier time finding employment and opportunities and housing and, and so forth because that's just the way society is, unfortunately. You know, we're so programmed like we did at Pledge of Allegiance and, and you know, that's why I call it Kaepernick gets on his, knee, on his knee because there's a whole bunch of inequality in America. And so when you try to figure out this budget thing of when, where, how, who, to spend your money on, you need to take into consideration how we're affected, and we're still affected by cultural post-traumatic stress disorder, colonialization. I've got some discrepancies with this uh, uh, committee thing here as well, without, I'll volunteer at that point too. Um, it's all about equality and inequality, and, and you know, we, we do want to be known as a as a state and a city that helps the vulnerable, not like those people in power that abuse people. You know, people in your position, it used to be a virtue. It wasn't a, a, a status. It wasn't a position. It wasn't where you got rich and and benefited and networked. It's where you help the people that were the most vulnerable. You know, the elders and the, the seniors and the women with children, and there's so many programs out there for these people, but there's hardly any for the Native men, you know, and and when you get down to the answer, you shouldn't thank God for them, you got to listen to the sermon and the prayer. And I, for one, have been, you know, I, I, I love the body of Christ, but I don't like organized religion, because they're as hypocritical and racist and discriminatory than anybody, you know. Um, so, Spiritual-wise, you know, I'm really happy for the job that the Anchorage Rescue Mission does, but there's not enough facilities for men. And so being able to work with the Anchorage Coalition for the Homeless, there are, there are solutions. And I, I like writing about them. And don't think I'm just picking on the Caucasians, because I'm going to pick on the Natives, too. Um, I'm 
we need to get them involved. And thank you. Um, please follow my entrance press releases. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify? Welcome. My name is Rose Hubbard. My name is Rose Hubbard, and I'm with Anchorage Community Homeless Village Project. Um, I have two concerns about this: is that um, it only funds, um, it appears to only fund uh, cold weather shelter. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Uh, I believe that is the intent. Yes. Okay. Um, well. If that's the case, there are like rain, which we're experiencing right now. That causes a lot of health issues for unsheltered individuals. Uh, they get their clothes wet, their sleeping bags wet, their, um, and then they don't have a place to dry out or a place to dry uh, their clothes. Uh, I do support um, the emergency sheltering, but I would like to see a. a extended out uh, to include more than just cold weather. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify? Welcome. Uh, hi, my name my name is David Rittenberg. I'm program director at the Brother Francis Shelter. Um, obviously in support of um, supporting cold weather shelter. Shelter's already full. It's already cold out. Um, we're having to turn people away at night. I don't have the numbers from last night, um, but since the cold weather started and this rain started maybe about two or three three weeks ago, we've been filling up just about every night as early as 8 o'clock, 8.30. So this is extremely important for just keeping people alive um, and having people have access to shelter. So, you know, this is something that we have funded every year, and I know this year has been um, a pretty uh, unique year for us and, and we, um, in receiving the $400,000 to keep us open, are, are kind of uh, contributing to this issue currently um, and we understand that we're very grateful for the help from the assembly so we could just stay open at 240, um, but the fact remains that 240 is not enough for the community and uh, this cold weather shelter does need to be uh, funded because it, you know, it, it's going to just get colder, it's supposed to be getting 10 inches snow in Hatcher's Pass this weekend. That's going to come down to Anchorage sooner than we're all probably ready for. Um, and uh, 240 just isn't, isn't enough for the community. Thank you. I have a question for you. I sure. also want to note for the record that we've been joined by Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Wells. So, so 8 o'clock, you're physically full. People are in there. And then some number come there. How many more people? Where do they physically end up? Um, so starting on Tuesday, we're partnering with the Anchorage Safety Center to do some overflow shelter there. Um, so down at the jail, that is kind of a, um, they need to prioritize Title 47 folks. And so the capacity there, um, like they email us every hour saying we have 10 beds available, we have 12 beds available, 15 beds available. And that system works as sort of like a stopgap, but um, um, as it gets colder, the numbers that are coming down to seek shelter increase. Um, you know, there's still, I'm sure as, as many of you have seen, there's still some hardcore campers out there. Um, but as it gets colder, people are going to be coming in to seek shelter. Um, the turnaway numbers are anywhere between, say, 5 and 10, all the way up to 30, 35. Um, you know, and that's just in this initial time. This is really sort of the hardest time for people too because in the winter time, in the middle of January, people know I need shoes. People know I need a jacket. And right now people are just sort of, you know, they may have been able to get by this summer with flip flops or, or you know, not necessarily um, being prepared for the cold. And now that this cold weather has hit, um, you know, people people are um, um, needing those resources. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Welcome. Don't say that, Felix, anymore. I'm not welcome here. Say it as I mean. Go ahead. My name is Ron Oliva. I own a business adjacent to Brother Francis Shelter, Beans Cafe, and I'm 
heavily affected to the point where I'm moving from my location. Although you can see these signs, I'm going out of business, total liquidation at that location. Uh, this money, first of all, has no budget. We had a liquor tax proposal. The reason it failed is you didn't have a budget for the money. And when you throw money like this off, <coughs> including the extra 400000 you've got to be accountable for that money. The reason I'm having difficulty even liquidating is the fear that my customers and consigners have. I've lost so much business over the last four years because you keep sending the overflow there. It's overpopulated. It's truly and accurately mismanaged. So when they kick people out, the neighbors get it. And then it also draws, well, all the campers in the old native hospital site. Even Miss Ward won't repair the fence because it's a daily occurrence, as is garbage, fecal material, needles, etc., etc., etc. Now, Miss Zamatel uh, had some questions. I don't think they encompassed the questions that I gave you multiple times. And I'm the number one attendee at this homeless meeting for the last 10 years. And I didn't get any written answers. But the biggest one is when you kick them out, why did you kick them out? Because you didn't have a space, their behavioral problems? And if you kick them out for behavioral problems, why didn't you report them to the police if they were fighting or acting aggressively? Because I know Beans and the Brother Francis, when I possibly raised my voice and shook my finger in the hallway, they got a restraining order against me. Now, if they got a restraining order against me, what do they do with those bad residents that they kick out and put a burden on the rest of the neighborhood? This is totally wrong to appropriate the funds. Uh, it's totally wrong to have a sole source contract. Uh, there's so much wrong with this that after going to see my counselor, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. And that's what you're doing. But I consider it now the new normal instead of insanity. Uh, it's very sad. But to summarize, if anyone feels the effect of this, it's me. And my business, my employees, my clients, and you did a great injustice with the decisions you made because these people get carte blanche. Mr. Dunbar had a question for Beans. They were about to get $440,000 and no one was there. When you ran through the homeless coordinator's salary at 196 dollars she wasn't at the assembly for that ordinance. She was on vacation. These kind of people don't deserve this kind of funding. And to come up here and shed some crocodile tears that someone's going to freeze to death, give that up. That, hey, if there's any truth to that, come see me. Because that, they're nothing but big cons that are taking the taxpayers' money and spending it not wisely with their investment. Because now it's getting cold. What they do all summer? And what did the homeless coordinator do for three years at a salary of 196.7? Now on the salary of the city for 176.9. That's three quarters of a million dollars for one person for leadership. And look at the results. In any corporation, she wouldn't have lasted. Thank you. Do your job, have some courage, and say no to this. Would anyone else like to testify? Welcome. Uh, Ralph Couples, property and business owner at Third and Hyder. Um, I have uh, just a, a couple, um, before I start, I've got a couple quick questions for a couple of the, the ladies here. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Lisa Kino. Um, can you tell me what are the current hours? Sorry, Sorry but um, que you shouldn't be directing questions to uh, the public. You should be testifying to the assembly. Understood. Okay. If I say something that's incorrect, correct me. Um, I'll do that. 
<laughs> it's my understanding that Brother Francis Shelter is currently closed for a series of hours during the middle of the day, providing no <coughs> access to, say, restrooms, for example. Um, I'm unclear as to Brother Fr or Beans Cafe's access. Uh, my concern, and, and I'm not here to oppose the, the funding or, or Beans Cafe operating its whole other shelter for this season. That's not why I'm here today. But my concern is that uh, we are jumping from 240 people to 390 people. I'm not hearing any kind of increased access to restrooms. I don't believe that there's going to be, and again, if I'm wrong, someone correct me, um, where's the increased capacity for all of the other things that these people need to survive and function other than a bed? My understanding is that Beans Cafe is already feeding twice as many people every single day as their original design capacity, and we're going from 240 to 390. Where's that food coming from? Where's that kitchen capacity coming from? Where are the toilets for these people? Who takes that burden? The neighborhood, the community. I do. He does. He does. We are the ones that take on that burden, and we experience that impact. And so I would encourage this body, and I understand you don't have any time. It's cold. But moving forward, you need to find a different location than East 3rd Avenue to continue to put these people because we do not have the resources for all of the other things that they require other than a bed. Any questions? Thank you, yes. I have Did I speak correctly? Uh, Mr. You do have a question. Yeah, we have some. Uh, you, Rob, didn't say <coughs> any groups that you're part of or what brings you here. So I wanted to, you briefly intimated that you were down at third out. Just tell us a little bit about uh, what so, uh, the variations are so it's on the record. Okay, so I'm a member of the Third Avenue Radicals Community Group. We are a group of local uh, property owners, business owners, residents, etc., who have bound together to support each other, basically to protect each other from all of these things that we face on a daily basis from the continued consolidation of this population. And so we have found strength in numbers, in binding together and supporting each other and working together to try and create a safer, cleaner environment for us to live in and for our, our customers to come to. These people don't want to come buy his products that he's trying to sell. These are all things that we're experiencing on a daily basis. Um, you know, I have, on a regular basis, uh, I experience prowlers and trespassers that I find video footage. You know, I, I, every single day I have to scroll through the video footage of my property to see what transpired at 3 in the morning. I have another question for you. Ms. Ellison. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can, um, if you were down there last winter, can you tell me what your experience was with um, last winter? <sighs> Well, okay, so last season um, I had my property broken into three times in less than three weeks. And um, twice, two out of those three times, I actually confronted the individuals while still in my structures. Um, it's, there, there, there's sort of, and it's this time of year, there's about, a, in my opinion, there's an eight week window when people are transitioning from their fun lifestyles out in the trees to, oh crap, I need to do something. And there's about an eight week window where I experience 90% of my incidents and it's like October and November, where people are transitioning, but they, they don't want to be in the shelter. They're trying to find somewhere to be. Ultimately, I don't know where they end up. But for the most part, once it gets cold and stays cold, for me personally, the incidence and rate drops off. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Sure, Mr. Johnson. I recently heard that members of APD had labeled your group Third Avenue Anarchists, and I just want to apologize to you on behalf of myself because I recognize the hard work you're doing down there to try to protect yourself from this amazing uh, nightmare that has been developing for the last 20 years. So I just wanted to say that from me personally to you right here on the record. So we did experience from APD directly to our group, they said, your name is terrible and you need to change it. They told us to our face in a meeting with APD. And so, which 
To me, that tells me they don't know the first thing about us. They don't know what we've done. They don't know what we stand for, and they most certainly don't know what we experience. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one. Public testimony. Oh, did you want to testify, Mr. Griffin? Go ahead. My name is Eugene Carl Hayden. I represent myself. Follow the public process when the public process is an appropriate decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest other than that to evaluate. Um, note for the record on this issue, this went for introduction at your last year the morning, guys. This is so that members who may not have been at that meeting when you brought this an introduction may not be aware of the history and how it was introduced. The fact is we introduced. Instead of going to the next regular meeting, we went and did a special meeting. That's what this is for public hearing. My concern in doing that, though I respectfully I see the urgency of dealing with the issue because the result of it is we're dealing with cold weather coming in and you need to make the decision. But with all due respect for it being introduced, it should have been done more respectful to the public so that it had been at a regular meeting and the public could have been engaged on this issue, not in the morning on a weekday when people of many in Anchorage are working, but in the morning and evening at a regular meeting discussion. Now, I'm not asking you to delay, okay? But the is, is, issue right now is we're walking into winter really quickly and you need to get an answer. But this was totally disrespectful to the community in Anchorage, the way it was handled and the fairness so that can be engaged. And not in this room that's clearly getting to overcrowd situation. There's not a video audio for the public to witness what's going on, except for a video of the news media which have experts in the excerpts in the news. But again, I'll remind you then, just one little clip here on this. With respect, I witnessed a lot of meetings and you dealt with the homeless. And I've seen it over the years and you're, you're very involved and you're discussing the issue. And I appreciate that and I'm sure the community appreciates that. But versus what I said at a joint meeting yesterday before the Borough Assembly meeting, the Anchorage Assembly, you're discussing it and you're addressing it and you're trying the best you can do so I could see there could be improvement. But out there in the Borough, they act like there is not a homeless issue because they're not discussing it. You don't hear it being discussed. And when, the, when a member of you asked a question at a previous joint meeting uh, of the Anchorage Assembly Borough Assembly, not last time, but a previous one, is there a homeless issue in, uh, in the Valley? And the response from an Anchorage Assembly, Borough Assembly member was, it's not a problem. Well, that's fake news, and that's the situation we're going. And I want to close with this. Thank you for at least dealing with it more respectfully than happening in the Valley where over 100,000 people live. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Salazar uh, wanted me to clarify to members of the public that item 5A will not be a public hearing item. So um, just in case any members of the public were confused about that. So, um, would anyone like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. Madam Clerk, do we have a motion on the floor? Thank you. What is the will of the body? Moved and seconded by Ms. Salatel. No. Oh, I was trying to make a motion at the same time. So oh, okay. excuse me. Okay. 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 Uh, no, no, there was no second. So, can I get a second? Uh, seconded by Ms. Quinn Davidson. Um, any discussion? Ms. Salazar. Yeah, just for it. Yeah. Uh, move to regular meeting uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so there's a motion to postpone to Tuesday, October 8th. Uh, seconded by Ms. Kennedy. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Yes, Ms. Salazar. Um, I move to postpone. Um, Partly because the information we requested over a week and a half ago came in um, to most members last yesterday afternoon. Um, came to me at 9.30 last night. Um, I was left off the original email um, by mistake. Um, and it also came with a 61 page attachment. I do not have the capacity to digest this amount of information, follow up on it, and engage in the public process. 
um, on this short of notice. I've been at community councils talking about this with no answers. Um, I asked for the original postponement so we could get information, fully vet the appropriation that we're asked to do. This is a tough appropriation because it's only for $200,000 of it as well. Um, so I would um, appreciate your support and having more time, two more business days is not going to make or break the situation. The um, contract is slated for November 1st um, that this appropriation will go with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I, I would support that conversation on the next item 5A, but I think that we can split the difference here and fund the appropriation so that the community knows we have this <coughs> available for the emergency system, whatever is to be developed. So I think there's a pretty good difference between the two items. And so um, I don't mean to be oppositional here, but I think we should fund the money so that whomever out there is contemplating uh, potentially being an operator under this system can see with confidence we've done the first half of it, we made it available. And the second question I think is, how do we get through 60 pages? And that, but I think that really relates to the actual contract and not the funding. So thank you. Mr. Wells. I think a couple of little so, so this first one is uh, 200,000. That's, that's essentially part of the second one. Yeah, this is basically replenishing the money that was used to fund actual shelter in the absence of funding for actual shelter, like regular shelter. And so this will replace those dollars that we would be relying on in order to execute any kind of contract with any provider to provide emergency shelter. Okay. And I kind of agree with that. Um, we got a bunch of stuff yesterday. So, but then it's cold out and it's wet. It's pretty bad. So I mean, is it something that um, you know, we change it from 200000 to 10000 and if I do we can today and then we'll do it the Tuesday. No, I mean, All or nothing. to be honest, you know, October and November last year and part of December were not, we did not have adequate emergency shelter in place. <coughs> That's causing issues for the community and I would suspect for people that need shelter. Right now we have safety patrol center is making very limited space available, but that means that same group of people that are transitioning from the, the woods or wherever they're transitioning from to somewhere warmer and not wet and cold and being subject to hypothermia or whatever else they might be dealing with are looking and roaming and looking for space. So that's the situation we're in. $10,000 would not provide us with any actionable ability to execute any contract with anyone. And to, I wanted to also clarify that um, any operator who goes into contract with us to do the services could take up to 30 days to actually get staff, appropriate bunks, all of the things that would be necessary, train their staff um, to be able to even take on those folks. So um, time does matter. And um, while we want it to start on November 1st, that doesn't mean that any operator would be able to do that in reality and provide safe um, supported uh, shelter. We're, I mean, we've proposed that in this contract that November, I mean, October, yeah, November 1st would be the date when this contract would start, but that doesn't mean that the operator can start then. So if we're approving funds and a contract on November 8th or, no, you know, two weeks later past that, then um, you should plan for at least 30 days from the start of that. And so November 1st, so October 8th, you say, let's say, we get something in agreement within five days from that date because there's no contract in place we're negotiating you know we haven't finalized anything we don't have approval for anything so that could take more days so five days let's say just guesstimating then it would be 30 days from that point that we have an agreement in place and an executed procurement that that organization or entity would start their services we only have safety center till October 31st. So there will be November 1st to whenever um, a gap in even the 10 or, you know, those 10 or 15 spots. I mean, Robin mentioned a couple of things like you have enough toilets, et cetera, and so on. Those facilities can speak to their toileting ability, but I do know that they have 
toilets and other um, things available for people who are using their services. So they're not just providing beds, if we think there's opportunity and access to um, a meal and to um, bathrooms and other things. I can't speak, I would prefer them to speak to their own capacity to provide bathrooms. So <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nimmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so I, I want to make sure that I understand this clearly and also perhaps for the public. So our next item is the sole source contract that Ms. Sadalta was referring to, which I believe goes November 1st is the start date for that, correct? It, November 1st is when we're proposing we would like to have something in place. In right. reality, it will be 30 days past whenever anything is actually agreed upon. But the item that we're discussing right now $200,000 for more general emergency this shelter? Is yeah, this is replacing the emergency shelter funds that you guys have previously appropriated, and we appropriated uh, through a assembly action to give to Brother Francis to maintain operations so in, on July 31st of so this year. So for the next month, um, you know, we've heard it's, it's about to start snowing. It's already cold and wet. Um, for the next month, if we were to appropriate this $200,000, would you actually use this $200,000 or not? No, this appropriation has to be in place for us to even be able to negotiate or execute any contract with any operator. <coughs> okay, so right now there's no resources set aside to negotiate any contract. So basically, you're saying that for the next month we don't really have anything? Right, we have family shelters, but the church system, we have um, up to 30 beds possible at safety center or spots to warm and stay. Um, that depends, though. So if you have a, like a higher level of Title 47 holds that space, that, that varies. Um, and so that night. and that space you're describing is unrelated to this two hundred thousand. Totally level. unrelated. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Ms. Benjamin. Uh, my question was answered. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, I think, has mostly been answered. It had to do with what Mr. Dunbar brought up in the time frame, and so. If we were to push this off to Tuesday's meeting, then that adds another few days to that, or shrinks that 30 day. Mm -hmm. It does, because we would still then now, once we have approval, then we would go in earnest to complete right. any contractual agreements with any organizations, and then once that gets in place, then that's okay. a set contract. And I'm feeling very conflicted about this because um, clearly this is a very serious community matter. However, I want to recognize that Ms. Velotel has worked so hard and, and has been um, doing a tremendous amount of research and putting forward so much effort on these issues that you know I, I want to support what you feel like needs to happen. So I just I would like some way to to resolve that conflict. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Hunts. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just restate what I think is the most reasonable path is award the funds to the budget, move the funds into the category where they can be spent, but don't award the contracts so we can actually look closely at the conversation of the contracts because there's certainty that we have determined for the public there's funding, and then we will do our due diligence in investigating the 60 pages. And so I think that um, that's the middle road here that we can achieve both outcomes as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Oh, Mr. No, he doesn't. Oh, okay. Um, I actually have a question then. Um, it's my understanding that the um, resolution um, with the funds is where we could actually uh, place any conditions um, or um, maybe address some of the issues that have been raised about the potential <coughs> the contract and not necessarily the contract itself because it's sole source and that's the negotiation um, between the administration and the provider. Um, and so I guess if there's some clarification that could be um, provided by council um, as to where we as the appropriating body and we've been asked to approve the contract, if we have any concerns where we can address those concerns. Is the resolution appropriating the money the more appropriate place or I just would like some guidance about that. I've been very I apologize, I, uh, I, I think I missed the first sentence of your, of your, of your question. But it sounds like you want to potentially address some concerns about the lease itself or about the, what exactly, which concerns are you seeking to? We raised 
a number. Of, I raised a number of questions um, about concerns about the potential of adding individuals to this campus for um, cold weather or for emergency shelter. Um, there looks like I don't know. I haven't had a chance to digest all the information, but after I get a chance to, there may be some role for this body to address those concerns. And to me, my understanding is the appropriate place to do that is in the AR, not in, with regard to the sole source contract. The two are related. Um, or do we have no mechanism? And I don't think that's right, but if it is, I mean, I, so I'm confused on where we are. Excuse me, I, I think the appropriate place is not the appropriation. The appropriation is simply moving money from one um, line item in the budget to another line item in the budget, or moving things from money to the assistance from fund balance to the health department. and. Um, the uh, appropriate place to control how the money is spent is in the conditions of the contract that you would then approve. And that I've seen done before, where the assembly has said, we approve this with the following conditions, limitations, et cetera. You can ask about that. There is a certain, there's a it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, I think there is a certain tension between um, the ability of the executive branch to enter into contracts and to spend money and the role of the assembly is moving money to their appropriate location and in approving or rejecting contracts. I think one tool available to the body is certainly to reject any contract which doesn't uh, address the concerns that you have. So that's one mechanism I think generally is more productive to have a dialogue to figure out if you can resolve those things and incorporate them into it or put them into the contract. I don't entirely know what your, the scope of what you're trying to address. Here and I apologize for not having the full background in today, but um, if, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more about kind of your bigger picture, what concerns you're trying to address, and what the appropriate vehicle might be. I don't think it is in the appropriation AR, though, in terms of dividing it, but I would have to talk to you more about it. Um, I have one follow up, please, Mr. Chair. Um, the, um, the other item we have before us is simply an AM, mm -hmm. um, and so that is usually a, a vehicle that we have. Mm -hmm. in that we have the opportunity in which to to do much with in terms of um, placing conditions or um, and it's um, and it's only been a, a single page of information that came in terms of that particular item uh, when it was originally presented for us. Um, so um, so I am a, I am a little bit confused on the process. No, and that makes sense. I know having provided you the advice about the previously about the AM and concerns and legislative of the uh, uh, of the of the of the body. I think here the the, the approval of the assembly is required for um, for the award of the sole source contract, which is slightly different from the AM previously, which was the explanation of legislative intent, which is required by Title II to accompany an AO. Um, this is an explanation of the contract. I think that you could, um, again, your primary tool is if you don't like the conditions of the contract to uh, define to approve the contract um, and uh, and provide direction on the record about what you would want to see in a different contract if, in order to have it reach the level where you would approve it. Um, I think in the interest of being together, I think, uh, be uh, uh, appreciated to give that direction in advance and help our that if you think you would potentially deny the contract. But I think that's your primary tool. It doesn't meet the conditions that you need to have it have because you at least this body has the power to deny the ability to move forward with the sole source contract. Um, in terms of the vehicle, if you wanted to, in a written record, state that what your what kind of um, what you would like to see. I think that's a little bit more difficult because you're approving a contract here and so the contract has already been negotiated. Um, I think it's more of a matter of giving the direction. But again, I think I need to talk with you later next about what it is that you're trying to achieve um, and the appropriate mechanism to do it. Just to get some clarification on that. Uh, sure, Ms. Wilson. So you said that contracts are already been negotiated. We're here and it takes 30 days to get it done. The contract isn't finalized. It's in, in, we've been in discussions. Once the final is finalized, it still takes the entity 30 days to hire staff, train okay. staff, find the proper types of vetting and things that need to go into that facility. That's the 30-day process that we <coughs> recognize that any vendor would have to do. Thank you. 
Yeah, and what I'm talking about is just the document we've gone back and forth with a team that's been negotiating, you know, is this party willing to do this service for us and what would the terms and conditions be of that? So it's not quite as simple as saying we'll prove it subject to these changes. That would require renegotiation and determination of whether or not the parties could even reach agreement on that. Thank you. Mr. Liss. Yeah, you all remember my proverb that <coughs> Public policy makers never ever make the right decision at the right time. You know, the rare times that the policymaker knows what the right thing to do, getting through the process, and, you know, the political will to get it done rarely happens. So we're almost always behind the power curve. And uh, Mr. Cross and I can argue about which one of us is the most frustrated <coughs> about where we're at. And, uh, It's easy to be critical, and it's easy for me to be critical, but I have not found any possible solution to these problems that this administration is not pursuing on some level or another. And the roadblocks, some of them were unexpected, and this funding issue for the state was beyond our control and very fluid. So we find ourselves in a situation, and I share your concern. I haven't even got, I don't think, the material, let alone read it. And uh, we don't have any other options. We, there's no facts that are out there <coughs> that will, in my opinion, alter our decision to go through this. Nor is there any other uh, service supplier that's in position to do what needs to be done, considering the time frames we have now. I'm darn irritated that that's where we're at. But, uh, pardon? Reality. Yeah, darn it. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think Ms. McPherson has answered the question I had, but just to reiterate, I do think it's appropriate today to agree with Mr. Constant. I think we should not postpone this and pass the funding resolution um, because we're still speaking to the motion to postpone. Um, but then there is a conversation to be had on Tuesday night about the kind of conditions we want to see placed on this contract. and. I, you know, regardless of whether or not the AM is the sort of appropriate vehicle for that in writing, we have to find a way to communicate that on Tuesday so they don't go too far down the road and get to a point where we reject their contract because then that will set us back in time is seriously a factor. So, so again, I, I am opposed to the motion to postpone this item, um, but I, I think that uh, I would be more open to a uh, motion to postpone the following item and then have a hopefully some recommendations on Tuesday night that would provide guidance to the administration. Although I feel like that's also a really tight time frame. There's no questions. Thank you. Mr. Constant. So I agree with everything you said except I believe that today for item 5A we ought to have a robust conversation about the items that we would like to see embedded into a contract that would be awarded on Tuesday. Not a conclusive list, but that we don't wait till Tuesday to have that conversation. We start that conversation today, right now, with what we have. That way we can not waste the weekend when the, the parties can go back and have their conversation. I agree with that. All right, then we better get moving, folks. So any other discussion? <laughs> <laughs> All right, seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll on the motion to postpone? Or do the, uh, just so we don't have to go through that, do the movers uh, want to take back that motion? I'll try the motion. Do you agree second? Thank you. Um, so then uh, we have now uh, back before us a motion to approve. Uh, any other discussion on the motion to approve? Seeing then, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll on the motion to approve? Yes, Mr. Chair. Can I Mr. Yes. That item is approved. Uh, moving on in our agenda, we now have before us item 5A, set of memorandum number AM 603-2019, sole source contract with Beans Cafe to provide emergency shelter services in an amount not to exceed $444,330. <coughs> um,
Sure, we can make that happen. Thank you. Move that seconds it. Um, mm -hmm. So any discussion on this item? <laughs> Mr. Constant. So uh, we heard from the public in the testimony on the item before that uh, there are concerns that need to be addressed related to uh, the interactions off campus, and in particular, uh, people using neighborhoods, streets, or toilets. And uh, what I would like to see in this conversation, and I understand and I apologize that this didn't happen before with our conversation with the or Brother Francis Shelter, because this will fall inordinately on one party, because this is their funding. But we need to see toilets as part of the conversation that go forward. This has to be available to people. If we're increasing 160 people, I understand that there's probably an equation that demonstrates how many toilets are needed for the safe operation of such an environment. So I would hope that that is part of the requirement of the contract. Thank you, you ask, can I ask a question? Are you asking that the, the, the contractor provide <coughs> bathrooms off campus and off street? Uh, I'm just clarifying. I would, you know, in the past, what has happened there, I think two or three times in the past several years, is there have been a line of portable bathrooms set up outside on the campus. I think there was a summer when there was human waste all over the campus that were testing pre and leaking the parking lot. And so, um, at, at that time, they installed, there was a time, at that time they installed some toilets, portables, and the, the fact is the problem went down. And so whatever the solution is, we aren't here to predispose that for you. Do the map on the number of bodies that are there and the number of toilets that are available at the time they're available, and then help us provide for that in one way or another, so that the impacts off-site don't continue or exacerbate. Thank you. I think Ms. Frick wants a bit of clarification. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to clarify that the municipality provided those facilities. And how that happens? And, and I think that's going to be the challenge of talking about one part of a multi-part system. Yep. That this is really literally about the beds and then how the whole thing goes together is, is, the, is a greater and valuable and, and really important conversation, but it has to involve the contract can't influence other things that aren't part of the service we're procuring. I, I want to offer Mr. Chair a quick follow that the service we're procuring is an additional 166 people onto a very tight piece of property. And so if what we're doing is adding bodies to a property that can't support the human needs, then we need to ensure that the human needs are met one way or the other because what we're doing then is perpetuating a problem, not finding a solution. And so the solution, the humans that come onto that site to sleep still have to poop. We need a place for them to poop, especially when they're pushed outside because that's just the nature of the schedule and the order of the operation, which we haven't yet had a chance to really think through these came to last night, which I appreciate. So whatever the answer is, we need ample facilities for people to do their necessary human business, otherwise this contract can't be awarded. Thank you. Mr. Nova. Yes. Okay, thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Kassen. I think you just made the news. Um, <laughs> not in a bad way. Just, uh, that's going to be the pull quote. Uh, and I think you're right, too. And in terms of the contract, I mean, if we are providing, and I agree with Mr. Kassen, this is sort of a, it's more than just a bed to me. And if it's the case that we are providing, that we are subsidizing, or we need to subsidize using our own uh, mobile toilet facilities, then perhaps we should reduce the value of the contract by that cost. And that should be part of the negotiation. But I, the question I have actually, first of all, is there someone from, is there Ms. Souter or someone from East Cafe here that could speak briefly? Would you mind, uh, could I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, could you come up and so you can. I can't see anyone. Yeah. Just so you can be picked up by the record recording. If you wouldn't mind stating your name, Kim Cobble, Deputy Director. Okay. Um, so for the administration and for the Dean's Cafe. So, and this is mostly just reiterative, but my understanding is this is not a novel contract exactly. We have done this or something very similar to this before, right? right. So how many years have we done this? So um, in the document I sent way too late last night, and um, I know for sure that Dean's location has been used since 2013 for up to 120 individuals. 
um, as overflow, emergency, temporary cold weather shelter, whatever iteration it was called, in addition to the um, individuals that were staying at Brother Francis. There's probably other historical knowledge, but that is what I was able to ascertain. We provided to you, it took us a little bit to get to the idea, we were really struggling with how do we provide you with information that would help you make determinations or decisions without compromising um, themes or any of our negotiations, which is why we ended up deciding to provide you with the emergency shelter application from last year and the contract from last year so that you could look at that and see that that is um, not novel, that we have done this in the past, we did it last year, and there are um, previous iterations of that. In 2017-18 uh, season, um, Securitas, we leased the space from Beans and paid um, some utilities and then also contracted with Securitas to provide the oversight at the Beans location. Um, in previous years, Brother Francis received a very small amount of funds to operate at Beans. And then in 2016, 2017, there's other people who just speak about There was a change in service due to an incident and um, that is when we brought on Downtown Soup Kitchen, I think, was asked to start providing shelter. And then Brother Francis, I believe, was um, teaching people up to the building to stay. So there have been multiple iterations. And last year, we contracted um, for 100. We thought we needed 100 beds. And we quickly um, learned on very cool nights that that wasn't adequate. And so Transit, um, City Hall, Transit, Health, uh, multiple groups, pulled together to say, okay, we can use the transit center, and we came up with some emergency operations, and Securitas was able to staff another place for people to come, and basically it was a warming station, an emergency to the emergency. So um, that's what we learned last year, and that is why we set the goal at 150, recognizing that we think there's at least 150. There's probably more, there's definitely more, but that's what we know is needed. So kind of follow up to chair really quickly. To, to, so I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, it's hard to measure the dog that didn't bark, right? But I do think that fewer people froze to death because of the things that we did these last two years with exactly this kind of program. But for Ms. Koval, you know, there clearly is some dissatisfaction about how it's been done in the past, the impact on the neighborhood. And now we're asking for a larger number of people. So what steps will Beans take to hopefully make this work better than it has in the past and particularly to account for, as Mr. Costin has raised, the human waste aspect of having an additional 100, well, I guess it's 46 people than we previously had there. Can I comment really quickly before Kim comments? You know, last year we did not have any shelter besides safety patrol over like the little bit of beds from October to December 15th. So a large part of some of the major disruption, I would suspect, is is a result of us not actually having a plan in place and a contractor in place to provide a safe and secure location. Beans operated last year, there was a lot, like high level of satisfaction with the patrons. Um, there was higher utilization than when we had had Securitas there. Um, they worked very closely with us and regular communication and we developed some really great practices. Um, and so I just want to put that out there that I don't, um, and I, I think we'll address bathrooming, but um, we're not going to be able to control um, people at, you know, during the next <coughs> 45 to 60 days, even if we do provide additional bathrooming, that's not going to solve some of the disruption to the community. But Beans was a great operator last year, and we really appreciate that they were able to come to the table um, and take over from December 15th to the April 30th. Do you have anything to add to that? I want to clarify, there's a lot of misconception here that there's an additional 160-some people. They're already there. Yeah. They've been there. When Brother Francis um, altered their operations, and I'm not here to speak to Brother Francis because we're great partners, a lot of those folks drifted over to Beans Cafe. We are uh, licensed, not licensed, excuse me, we are fire permitted, I meaning the fire marshal asks how many people are in our building. I can have 251 in our building. Of that, 230 roughly are clients. The rest would be staff, volunteers, kitchen staff, etc. We are at capacity. We see upwards of 400 individuals a day, which means we have to rotate them out. We just had our bathrooms redone, completely redone. They are adequate for 250 people in the building, brand new bathrooms. 
The porta potty out this summer were fenced because we had to have a bathroom option for all the clients. Um, and when we had porta potties that Miss Kelly provided before, that means you have to have security on the campus to then patrol that area as well. Um, we work very closely with the Avenue Radicals. Well, we'll tell you, we work with them very closely. We send out <coughs> litter patrol teams to clean up the area. We work very closely with Tim and Kim Weeks. We work with John and Rhett Pitt. We work so closely with our neighbors, because we're neighbors too. It's our neighborhood as well. We have a good neighbor policy in place for our clients. And if the clients don't follow the neighbor policy, they cannot receive services with us. It's their neighborhood too. And we really promote this um, we really want them to be a part of the solution and not be the burden. And we do this with respect to the clients and to our neighbors. We worked very closely with MOA when we ran Mercy Corner Shelter last season. It was a Hail Mary effort to get it up and standing in the short amount of time we were asked. We have been asked repeatedly for four seasons now to do this. We said, Yes, the first time at a loss of $21,000 because the funding never showed up from the city. It was private donors who filled it. The second year we declined and then we were hauled back in and said, let's reconsider. So we said, fine, we'll lease the space to you and secure the top. The third year we were hauled in again saying, please do this. And we said, here's our budget. Go ahead and tell us what you want us to do. It went to RFP. It didn't work out. The other the other person that was selected didn't work out. They came back to us and said, fine, but we're done. We're not doing this again. And now here we are again, the fourth round. And we have said from the beginning, we have never asked for this. And yet we still stand up and do it. We don't want to find any more dead clients. I've had 15 in three years. It's exhausting. We have done it safely. We do it professionally. We do it with kindness and we do it with respect to all of our neighbors and to our clients. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I think Mr. Compton has a follow up and then I'm putting uh, it myself. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I hope you don't feel that people are coming to you and saying you're failing to deliver. What I'm hearing people say is there are holes in even this proposal that needs to be filled. And they, from what I heard today and what I see, is toilets and security. You even mentioned that the community uh, put toilets out there, there had to be security for the campus. And so that's a piece that just we have to figure out. And that's separate maybe from this conversation that we're having right now in terms of the specific contract that's being awarded to you. But it just is irrational on my end to consider adding more uh, without adding security and toilets. But they're already there. When you say adding more, they're already on the campus. Why are people <coughs> going to the bathroom in the woods then? That's the, the challenge that we have There's to address. Will. I, I, I can't control where they're going to the bathroom, but I can tell you if you come down and look at our brand spanking new bathrooms, they're being utilized, and we send out our litter patrols to help clean up, but I also can't put them in a third level hazmat suit. Right. I understand. So again, I'm not pointing to you when I say this. I'm pointing to our whole system that needs to be addressed. I think the numbers prove your effectiveness. In the last since 2018, when the cap team went down and inserted itself into the flow down there, your numbers or problems went in half at least and haven't gone back up. And so there's plenty of credit to your work that is there and should be recognized. So this is more about how we address the whole community health problem that's happening there. It's not about just you. So I would offer that at least my perspective. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> and hot chair, I guess. Um, so, in the interim, as I've been listening to this discussion, um, I've been brainstorming an idea with Mr. Constant and just checking to make sure it's uh, something that we can actually do. So, I'm just going to put this on the table as an alter alternative. But um, on Tuesday, we can lay on the table a separate appropriation, and Ms. Brick actually instigated this idea a separate appropriation um, up to $100,000. We can't exceed $100,000 because then it would require a public hearing. Um, and I don't, I don't think we would do $100,000, but um, an appropriation to uh, add restroom security, whatever other provisions that we think we need um, to deal with the community concerns and the neighborhood impacts separate from this particular item that we're debating now. So it would be uh, tied to it, but it would be a separate appropriation. 
Uh, yeah, right, so the municipality. So um, that's, it, it, I think, an alternative idea I just want to throw out to the body to see if you're interested in considering that. Um, but I do think what Ms. Burke raised was a valid point. And um, if we're going to look at systems change outside of this specific contract for shelter beds, then we should look at a separate <laughs> appropriation for that. Um, yeah, you're so, so. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, yes, and that, um, what you just um, indicated, is really what some of these questions are driving at. What is the true cost to do what we're going to do that um, takes into consideration the impacts, both um, you know, public safety calls, um, because a $444,000 contract, I don't think necessarily reflects the true cost. It may be what we're paying for the beds at night, but we don't have day services down there. Um, there are some issues here that are still unresolved that I would love to hear more about. Like, what about during the day when capacity is at 230 for individuals at Beans, and there may be 100 people in day shelter at Brother Francis? That still leaves over 100 people outside. Um, and that's where we get the impacts. Um, I've had the good fortune to speak to quite a few people with lived experience over the past week and a half because I really wanted to understand from their perspective how it works. Everything from the mechanics, like what does it mean when you go to the shelter and you check in at night to when you leave in the morning? And there are some really, uh, there's a, a group of individuals who are seeking shelter who are very concerned about being a Brother Francis because they don't want to be a low barrier. They, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just trying to balance the needs of everyone who is affected by this so that we provide safe sheltering. And some of this is a bigger systems issue than right now, but if we don't stop and have this conversation at some point, we'll just keep ticking along. And I very much appreciate being stepping forward to do this, even if it's reluctantly. I think we need to look at this earlier and I know this was a really tough summer for everyone, um, and really explore all the other options and do so collaboratively. Um, I guess I would just like to express, you know, I understand that it's the Department of Health and the administration's job to go and, and get this emergency shelter each year and bring it to us, but um, we have ideas too, um, and we're really engaged in this work, especially with the public, um, and they have good ideas as well, and so, um, I will digest this information and come up with some more specific questions to have addressed before Tuesday. I'm sorry, I, I don't have um, anything more clear to add to the conversation other than that issue of what are we going to do during the day with 100 people sitting on the campus. It's unresolved. We've got to talk about that. Um, I think that's where we get some of the neighborhood impacts. And I've heard from the people with the experience, there are individuals waiting to prey upon those individuals when the morning release happens. That is not okay. And we should address that. We have a public health and safety obligation. Um, and I, I take it very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wills. Well, I don't think I could add to what Mr. Wills talked about. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure I can add to that either, except to say I'm supportive of the approach that Mr. Rivera and Ms. Delzell have described. We think, especially when we're talking about day shelter, that's something we need to address. But I, I did want to say thank you to Ms. Cobalt for being here and for your role in helping to address and solve this really important community issue. And um, you mentioned actually that you are already supporting the, the number of people we're talking about. And the issue of food was brought up, and do you have then the means to address any increased demand as a result of this for food? Although it sounds like there won't be an increased we would demand. offer We would offer dinner service we did last year. We served 11,062 meals during the Merciful Shelter last year. We had 809 unique individuals, that's unduplicated. We averaged 84 meals a night and we averaged 106 people overnight. We were over capacity almost all the time. Don't tell the fire marshal. We did communicate to the municipality that we were. They, they knew and understood, especially for extreme cold temperatures. Um, unfortunately, that meant they had to sit up. We didn't have a mat or a cot for them. They would be you know, we called warming shelter, and they would just be sitting in a chair, and we could do them. Um, we do have a tremendous uh, group 
group of donors and resources that do help us. Um, we can pickle jar so much and store it up. I mean, it's, our, our jar storage is pretty amazing. The zombie apocalypse happened, we can find. You know, we, we, we really take a lot of measures to make the most of what's donated to us and also what we can procure at much better prices, depending on the poundage of what we're purchasing. And um, hunters and um, other professional groups like that are very generous in getting us wild game meat that our clients love to process and have fun with. So we, we're very inventive, but we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll, we'll keep feeding people, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we have somewhat of a plan-ish uh, to get through Tuesday. So a lot of work to get done in the next few days. Um, any other discussion before we vote on this one? Okay, Madam, uh, Mr. Madison. Just to clarify, so you came up with an alternative, but that means you approve this now and then do this. No, I, I would love to do the vote at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll on the motion to postpone? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Vera? Yes. Mr. Grant? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. A uh, legal update downtown Hope Center. Um, Ms. McPherson, if you uh, lay the groundwork for that, and I believe our intent is to go into executive session. Certainly, Mr. Chair. I said one. Can I add one thing? Yeah. I just want to say for the record, we did not invite teams last week um, at the assembly. That's why they weren't there in the past. We haven't had ha it been that has been necessary. So I just wanted to clarify that for the body that if I had known that was oh. necessary, we would have invited them. They did not just not show up.
is your uh, uh, responsibility to protect that from further disclosure. Um, with that, I would seek a motion. Um, again, the municipal attorney's office today seeks to meet with the assembly and executive session to provide an update on the status of the downtown Hope Center litigation. And I would seek a motion from the body to move into executive discussion, executive session to discuss these matters. Mm -hmm. Moved and seconded. Just uh, we're about to vote on this, but for members of the public, uh, we are going to ask you to leave the room while we discuss this in executive session. So we can start doing that. Um, for staff, if I can get uh, everyone's staff that's going to stay um, for this executive session, if you can put your name in the record, please. Um, Chair, I'm going to take you out of regular session. Um, was there any uh, opposition to going into executive session? Seeing none, we're in executive session. Okay.